Greetings, everybody. Today is the um, 13th of uh, February, 2022. Here we are in Royal, Illinois. And uh, again, we're celebrating the season of Epiphany. Take a look at this. Take a look at this bulletin cover. You'll see all these loaves of bread. Uh, Jesus is being, we're discussing Jesus as the bread of life. And he's the one that we feed on. It's a great passage. We're going to have two parallel passages, one from the Old Testament, which is, uh, which is, which ties into the reading about uh, Jesus in uh, the book of John chapter 6. Anyway, today is the whole idea about Epiphany, uh, the sixth, this is the sixth Sunday. And every one of these Sundays, we're talking about an invitation that God offers to have us draw closer to what it means to, uh, uh, to uh, savor the abundant life that Christ offers. Now, I know that uh, tomorrow is going to be uh, the celebration we always have. It's called uh, Valentine's Day, St. Valentine's Day. St. Valentine's, we remember that story about all the hearts and uh, our hearts and flowers and candy and stuff like that. But the real passage there, the real passion there is that the person of St. Valentine was a man that readily sacrificed his life so that others would know Christ. He was the one that made those those uh, sacrificial gifts continually throughout uh, the latter part of his life. And so we're going to be talking about one of these, uh, one of these situations that, that has come up to Jesus. Um, the passage that we're going to be reading to start with is from Exodus. Okay, in a nutshell, we know that uh, we he hear that phrase, Jesus is the bread of life. Uh, he makes that statement several times in John chapter 6. But there's a background story that really ties in. Here's the background story. Uh, we know that uh, at the time of the Exodus, the Jewish people, the, the Israelites, were leaving Egypt and they had to go. They had to go through the desert, and while they were in the midst of the desert, there was just this uh, lack of food, and so they were grumbling about God. He just he, they wanted to know why he didn't provide more, and uh, God doesn't like it when you grumble. Because obviously they had not only been saved from uh, death and slavery in Egypt, they were provided for on their entire trip across those 40 years as they got to the promised land. This is the passage from uh, Exodus chapter 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they can follow my instructions. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it is the, it is the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because you have, because he has heard your grumblings against him. Who are we that we should grumble against that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, "You will know that the Lord you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you the meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us. You are grumbling against the Lord." I'm not, I'm not sure if you caught that little word in there. He said, um, I am doing this and I will test him to see the, if they will obey my instructions. Um, I like this because um, he says it's a test. And he says this, each day you're to go out and gather. That was a lesson, each day. Each day there's a test. Now, I have often ask the uh, kids in my class, do you like tests? They go, no, nobody likes a test. Really? You don't like a test? No, I don't like tests. Do you play on a sports team? Yeah. I said, do uh, you have games? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you like the game? Sure, I like the teams. Did you know that the game is actually a test? The game is actually a contest. It's called a contest with a test to see how your level of play is improving. And everybody likes the idea, most people like the idea of a contest because it gives them an opportunity to... Um, test their ability, their skill level against that of others. They like to win, they sometimes lose, but they always like to play. Now that test comes and it says each day they are to gather. 
That's the, le that's the lesson. It's a daily test. Verse 6 says, in the, in the evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Why? Because he's provided for you in the evening. Verse 7, it says, in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he, because he has heard you grumbling. Verse 8 says, you will know that the Lord gives you the meat in the evening and the bread each morning because you are grumbling. What does that mean, to be tested every day? Do we see the evidence of God's presence around us each day? Well, we do. Do we recognize it as God's provision for us? Do we recognize it as God's challenge for us? There may be certain situations we don't like. We, we, uh, we're not too keen on things. But you remember what he said, what we said last week? Jesus says, you want to see miraculous signs and wonders. Unless you see these signs and wonders, you will not believe. We are constantly looking at all the evidence each day to see what the evidence is. Can that sort of lift up our spirits, cause us to be uh, evaluating continually what God has provided for us? I think so. Uh, I do want to show you this before we move on too far. Take a look at this. Take a look at this, uh, this chart over here. You see this name here? You see this guy? You see Boaz? See Boaz right there? Boaz, this is uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez. This is the time here. In this time period here, all the Jewish, all the Israelite people were in Egypt. They were in Egypt. And they knew the stories about what was going, had gone on in the past. They didn't like that. It was a very, it was a very difficult time. They, stuck, they still talk about how terrifically horrible those times were. But it's right in here. This is Salmon and Rahab. Remember, remember the story about Rahab? Rahab and Boaz and Ruth. This is where they have come out of slavery. So this story that we're talking about right now uh, that I just mentioned here from uh, the book of uh, Exodus chapter 16, it talks about what those people went through. Now, this is a reminder. This is a, we, we go back to the story. We can sort of check in. We can reread, we can retell, and we can, we can review what it is that happened. Now, this is the same story here in the desert that the, uh, that the people that come up to Jesus right now, and they remind him of what happened in the desert. This is what it says in John chapter 6. This is John chapter 6, beginning at verse 28. Now, remember, just the last several weeks, through John 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, Jesus is displaying his power, displaying his person, and people are marveling and they want to see more of these, uh, more of these signs and wonders. And so they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus uh, answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Verse 30. So they ask him, what miraculous sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now they're going back to that story that I just mentioned to you from Exodus 16. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it was not Moses who had given the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives it, the true bread in heaven. For the bread of God is, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's referencing himself. And they say this, verse 34, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. Do you get that? That's not a request. That's a demand. This is what we want. Now, we know this to be true because the first part of this chapter, it says that people trailed, they tracked him down. He had, Jesus had just provided bread for, he fed the 5,000. He provided this amazing amount of bread for all these people that were hungry. I mean, they wanted their bellies full. 
understandably, that's, that's not a bad reason. But they were demanding this amount of bread. So my question is, so what is it that, what is it that we keep demanding of God? It says, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But I, as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. It's interesting. There are, there are thousands of people coming. He will never drive them away. But he will always be asking them, where's your heart condition now? What is, the, what is the desire of your heart now? How hungry are you? Are you hungry just for the food for your belly? Or is there something else that you, that you long for? Remember last week? Remember last week I, we talked about that story in John chapter 4 where there was this father. Uh, he had heard about this miracle that happened in Canaan weeks before. And he was from Capernaum several weeks after the miracle in Canaan. This father came back to Canaan. He was, a, he was uh, the text tells us that he was of a royal personage. And he came back and he waited for Jesus to come into town. And he begged Jesus, could you please, could you please help my son? Now his son was 20 miles away in Capernaum. There they were in Canaan. And Jesus says, this is the comment, and I'll repeat it for all of us again. Unless you see miraculous signs, uh, mirac miracles and miraculous si signs and wonders, you'll never believe. And then he told the father, go, your son is healed. As the man was going back to his home, you remember the story? As he was going back to his home, he was met by the people from his, ho from his house, his household. And they said, your son's, your son's well, he's alive. And so the father asked the clarifying question, at what time did it happen? And they said about the seventh hour, which was the precise time that Jesus had said it would happen. Do you remember what the text said? Then the man realized. That means he took into account what Jesus had said, the time it was said. It said then he realized. He came to an awareness. That's it. Jesus did it at that time. In that same verse, it says, and the rest, at, at that time, he and the rest of his household believed. So here's my question. How long does it take for us to keep asking, to, to keep receiving the bread? Jesus says, um, the one that the Father, all that the Father gives me will, will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. He never sends anyone away. They keep, they keep, they sort of keep nibbling away, sort of pecking away. And, and many of these people, over the time, they simply stop inquiring. They stop feeding. They stop, they stop inquiring. They stop asking for that bread, that, that nourishment. But see, he will never turn them away. He says in verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to, not to do my will, but to do the will of of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. I shall lose none of all that he has given me. Did you get that phrase? He's given each one of us to Jesus. We talk about the gift that Jesus has been to us at Christmas time. But God's gift to Jesus was each of us. <laughs> That's true. That's a great idea, isn't it? God gave us to Jesus as a gift. And he's going to hang on to us. Now, there may be some people that fight like crazy to get away, but he's going to hang on to us. It says this, For the Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. He repeats that twice. I will raise him up on the last day. I don't think there's any issue with Jesus that he has this uh, keen ability to take all the, 
accounting of all the people, all the thousands, the millions of people. He, he can do that. What matters is that he knows you and he knows me. It's not who we know, it's who knows us. And Jesus evidently is keen. He will never forsake us. Again, in verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert and they died. But here is the, but here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which, for which I will give my life for the world. Now here comes a silly argument. Uh, it makes sense to the people at the time. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, I, I understand that people want to argue about that. The whole idea is, is that we will not consume his actual body, but we will stand with him. We will be drawn to him. We will be in that presence by him. And there will be, we will have that opportunity to be drawn to do that thing for which he, he comes. I came up with this little uh, analogy and it kind of hit me. We have many people who have been members of the church for a long time. And sometimes uh, it seems as though after years, um, their faith uh, sort of um, falters and they lose interest, they drift away, they, they tend to forget. I heard this story uh, several places and it really, it was very striking for me. Um, you may remember that uh, it was two, three, three years ago, 2019, that uh, uh, it was uh, Notre Dame, the uh, huge church in central Paris. Uh, there was a huge fire there. It took, uh, it just gutted the, the, the main sanctuary at the Notre Dame. That sanctuary was started, it was starting, the building began in 11... 63, I think, something like that, 1163. And it took 182 years to build it, 182 years. Now, that's probably five or six generations of families worked on that building. Can you imagine five generations, one generation and the next and the next and the next and the next, possibly the next, still working on the same building? Yeah, sure, it happened. It happened then. I was reminded of this story. They asked uh, one of the guys that was working there, they said, what do you, what's your job? And he says, well, I'm a stonemason. I said, what do you, what's your job? He said, I'm building this wall. He's building the wall of this big building, church, Notre Dame. They asked another guy, they said, what's, uh, what's your job? He said, well, I'm a carpenter. He said, um, I'm building the doors and, uh, and cutting the rafters that go into these places in, within the church. They asked another guy, they said, what's your job? He said, me? He said, I'm a laborer here. Well, what's your job? He said, I'm building the most beautiful cathedral in the world where people can come and worship God. That's my job. You see the difference? For some people, it's just a task to get through the day. For some people, it's a lifetime of an opportunity. Remember what I said when I started this message? I said that uh, this is what God says. Um, the people are to go out each day and gather whatever what was enough for the day. In this way, I will test them. You see, they're supposed to go out every day. What were they to do every day with the food? They were to eat it. They were to consume it. They were to use it to grow their bodies and build their confidence every day. They did that for 40 years. And when they finally got to the promised land, they kept doing, they kept eating the provision that God gave. That was their responsibility. As you and I as Christians, what is our responsibility? 
Our responsibility is to consume what Jesus gives to us. We ask of him. He provides for us. We consume that and we grow with him. When it says that we, uh, this line says, um, um, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus says, says to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat my flesh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have, you have no life in you. When we say that, that whole idea of eating his flesh, it means to be part and parcel of his body. It means we need to incorporate ourselves into who he is. It means we must trust in him. It means we must stand by him. It means we must commit to the things he says. Um, I've, I've heard this statement for a long time, and I found out that it was, uh, at least in the circles where I am and the history that I study, um, you ever heard that phrase, draw the line in the sand? Draw the line in the sand. Uh, the story was that um, uh, a guy named Francisco Pizarro he was uh, he was he was coming in uh, from the, from Spain, and his and his troops were divided. They weren't sure where to go. Some decided they were going to abandon him. Some decided they they weren't sure they might stay with him. So he took a literally took a sword and he drew a line in the sand. He said, "Those who are with me, step on this side. Those who are not with me, stay where you're at. But when you cross over and step on this side where I'm at." then we are committed to go forward together. So when it says to eat his body, it literally means to take on what Christ has to offer. It literally means to allow him, his life and his words to take, take shape and take a stand in our life. That we're committed to him and that we, yes, we stand with him because he chooses us and we likewise respond to him. When we nudge our way over closer to him, to that place where, where he's at, it takes a lifetime for some. For some, it's, it's an instant. And I do know people that have come to faith at the very end of their lives with just mere minutes to go. One story that I love to tell, it happened back in 19, uh, 1969, 1970. There was a, uh, a young man, his name was Andy. Andy and I, I only met the man one day in my life. I think he was 14 at the time. I met Andy this day and we went to the uh, uh, big airport in, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we were standing there talking with all these people and there was, a, there was an older lady sitting on this, um, waiting to, to get a flight, not sure where. And Andy simply walked up to her just casually and they began to talk about Jesus and she said well tell me more about this young man would you please tell me more about this and Andy began to share with her about Jesus and he said he said you know Jesus is in my life now I've only known him for a few days but he's made all the world all the difference for me and he said would you like to would you like to know Jesus in your life and he asked the, this older lady turns out I think she was about 82 and she said, uh, yes. So he said, well, can I pray this prayer with you? She said, that would be fine. And so she bowed her head and Andy held her hand and they prayed together. And uh, she asked the Lord Jesus to come into her life. And after she raised her head, she smiled and she thanked Andy and they chatted for a little while. And pretty soon um, she got really weak and she she leaned back and she rested and they, they got a gurney and they came and they, they got her and they took her and they put her on the elevator to go downstairs. And before the door closed, she said, um, thank that young boy, thank that nice young boy for sharing Jesus with me. Thank you. And they took her downstairs and before they got her out of the building, she passed away. That's the story we heard. And I thought to myself, what a wondrous thing to tell people with their own lips how important it is to know Jesus in our hearts. 
We can do that. I believe these individuals here, these individuals are asking Jesus for a lot. And Jesus is always offering them because he said, I will know, I will never turn you away. And in fact, he says, um, I tell you the truth, unless you eat of the flesh of my, the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you will have no life, he will have no life in you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Blessings to you. Um, have a, may you enjoy again this epiphany season as your heart is even made more ready to pre- and be prepared to say the things of what God would desire, what Jesus would desire of you to share with those around you. Take care. Bye now. Thanks.